Our Winnebago County Board proceedings will now come to order. Would you please push your attend buttons? And we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Supervisor Locke with the invocation. We come to you this new year of 2018 asking for your blessings and help. As we are gathered together this evening, show us how to conduct our work with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm. Amen. Amen. Supervisor Robel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been moved and seconded to approve this evening's agenda. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Oppose, carry. Now is the time for the public to express their opinion on anything on the agenda this evening. So if there's anybody from the public that would like to talk, you'd have to come up to the microphone in the back and state your name and address, and you can say what you want. Is there anybody from the public that would like to address the board on anything on the agenda this evening? Now is your chance to talk. That portion of the meeting will be closed. Reports from co committees, commissions, and boards. Supervisor Eisen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, January 9th is National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. As a member of the Winnebago County Judicial and Public Safety Committee, Winnebago Safe Streets Initiative, as well as the Wisconsin Counties Association Judicial and Public Safety Steering Committee, I would like to thank our Winnebago County and municipal police officers for the job they do to maintain peace and order every day. It is most fitting to say thank you for the job you do. Okay, <clears throat> we'll go on to County Board's Chairman's Report. Supervisor Harp. Supervisor Fiery and Supervisor Finch had asked to be excused from this evening's meeting, so they are excused. I just want to remind everybody that the legislative exchange uh, is coming up in Madison on February 6th and 7th, so if you, there's some that quite a few have applied, but if somebody wants to go, please go to the clerk's office. You can get the form and fill it out and apply to go. So that's on February 6th and 7th if somebody else wants to go. Uh, at this time, I would like to present Sheriff Motts. He's going to be giving us a presentation on jail population at the Winnebago County Jail. Sheriff Motts. Good evening. I'm going to pull this out of the way. So this is... Uh, an overall look at our jail operations as well as a look at our uh, population in the jail and the concerns that we have uh, given the uh, population increases. Uh, first of all, the reason that we have a jail is a statutory requirement uh, that we uh, have a jail that meets DOC, Department of Corrections, Statute, statute 350, and there are criteria on that, some of which I'll talk about in this uh, presentation. The, uh, the personnel in the jail, we have 79 deputies. That's out of, uh, uh, those are association member deputies. Uh, there are um, 123 deputies, association members deputies, not including the administrators uh, that work for the sheriff's office. And so you can see that the majority work in our jail division. We have 14 booking security clerks, seven civilian staff, 15 contract employees consist of uh, three different entities that we contract work with, Aramark, which provides our meals, Correctional Care Solutions, provides our health, ment mental health and health uh, services, Family Services, which provides counseling, such as family counseling, anger management, and the like. 
Then we have 75 volunteers, and they handle uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Spiritual Counseling, and GED uh, uh, counselor, not counseling, but GED classes. That's offered through Fox Valley Technical College. Our current design, we have six uh, inmate housing units. Three of them are direct supervision, and they look like the uh, picture on top here. Um, uh, the uh, deputy remains in the pod with the inmates. Uh, there's an officer station. This is not our, our, uh, our jail, but certainly it's very similar in nature. Uh, we house between 64 and 68 uh, inmates uh, in this pod, and they are minimum classification. I'll talk about what uh, constitutes a, a minimum classification. Then there's three indirect supervision pods, and those are individual cells with a common day room, and it's more the traditional uh, type housing. Uh, they are either solid metal doors uh, that uh, they are inside a singular cell, or they house um, between four and, and 32 uh, inmates, so they're smaller in nature. And those, uh, again, house between 37 and 64, they're medium and maximum security. The indirect uh, supervision pods are then subdivided into smaller units, and they house between that four and 32 inmates. Um, and that's uh, similar to what they look like. There's an officer station. Uh, they uh, uh, conduct security rounds every 15 minutes where they actually make uh, visual contact with all of our inmates. Inmate classification, each inmate is classified using an objective classification system. It's called COMPASS. That is a requirement uh, to determine housing allocation. COMPASS is uh, just one of the uh, uh, classification systems that's used throughout the United States, but it is a leader uh, in uh, inmate classification. The level determines privileges and programming. Uh, first is uh, Huber and electronic monitoring. Huber inmates are, just as you remember them uh, for many years, uh, they go out up to 12 hours a day. They return back to our facility. They spend 12 hours in our facility, then they go back out to work or to school or um, sometimes childcare. Then electronic monitoring is basically a house arrest type situation. Uh, we monitor their geographical location uh, throughout the day uh, and evening, 24 hours a day. They're given parameters, both geographical and time limit, time frame, so they can go to work, and that has a geographical area uh, that takes them from their residence to work. They have to remain there. We're notified if they leave, and there's an alert. Uh, it also is used to determine their day room time for those inmates uh, that remain in our facility and their access to television, telephone, and uh, other amenities. Uh, their length and frequency of visitation, their access to jail programming, GED, Alcoholics Anonymous, NA, and reentry counseling. And the, uh, the reason that we use these things, as well as access to commissary, which they can purchase uh, snacks and, and various items from. And we use all of these things to control their behavior uh, so they understand uh, that uh, their behavior really determines how much freedom they have along with why, uh, why they're in our facility and what their previous record is. Other classification uh, factors that we use are keep separates uh, in general population. So we have co-defendants that may uh, be involved in the same uh, crime. We also have victims of crimes that commit other crimes and, and now they are in our facility as well and we need to uh, uh, keep them separate. Rival gang members, inmates that cannot get along. We have some that are just antisocial and they cannot get along. Uh, special needs inmates, those that have medical and mental health monitoring, and I'll talk more about the uh, mental health issues that we are seeing. With uh, the uh, uh, introduction of PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act. We need to have so separate housing for inmates that are likely to be victims of sexual abuse or other type of uh, abusive behavior. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these inmates are kept in a uh, separate area. And then we have administrative confinement, that those uh, inmates that present a substantial risk to physical harm or threatens the security of our jail. Uh, and we also use it for disciplinary uh, investigation. So that is this uh, type of cell where 
Uh, it is a one-person cell. They are given time out during the day, but they're typically kept uh, by themselves, and they are antisocial. And uh, unfortunately, we have seen more and more uh, of those types of inmates. Our current capacity is 355 beds. Functional capacity is 320 inmates. That gives us the ability to classify people, as we just talked about, in a manner that keeps our facility safe and secure. Our ideal capacity is 284 inmates. That's 80% capacity. That gives us the ability to deal with uh, problems that arise, whether it's a fight uh, in a, a pod where we have to move a number of inmates throughout the facility. We can do that with, uh, uh, with not with ease, but certainly if we're at 320, now we're making many moves just to get people moved throughout the facility so that we have the keep aparts and the other issues that uh, we have with inmates. You can, these are our average daily population. So this was the average for 2014. We averaged 287, 2015, 275, 294, and then 312 for 2017. So we have seen the increase from actually this 275 to this 312 within uh, two years. That's concerning. What causes it? Well, we went back and we looked at uh, a day where we had 353 inmates June 22nd of 2017. Uh, by the way, it, was, it wasn't our highest day, but we had 353 inmates. Our capacity is 355, and we looked at why those inmates were in our facility. Then we went back to 2016, and we looked at June 22nd, and we found that really it's the same things that they're coming to jail for, there are just more people committing the same types of crimes. So it isn't some new uh, uh, type of crime or new drug or introduction of a new investigative technique. It's just more people committing the same uh, types of, of crimes. We averaged uh, 17 and a half bookings per day in 2017. So that 17 new people come into our facility every day. Now when I say new, uh, some may be uh, frequent flyers, they've been there many times, but others it might be their first time and their last time. The average length of stay is 17.8 days, so roughly 18 days. That's how long the average person stays in our facility. Some only stay an hour. Some stay a year and even longer. Uh, you can only be, you can be sentenced to jail for one, uh, less than one year. So uh, you could be sentenced to jail for a, a year's time that typically doesn't happen but we do have people that have very violent crimes or very complex crimes that while they're going through the judicial process will take a year and sometimes even longer every person that goes to prison starts out in jail so Jeffrey Dahmer and all of the the famous uh, uh, serial murderers all started in a jail this is our admissions from 2013 to 17 in uh, 2013, we had roughly uh, 6,400 admissions, so 6,400 people came to our facility, and we're right back up there right now in, in 2017. We're almost at that 6,400 mark. We saw some decreases here. Um, what caused those decreases? Uh, you know, I don't know exactly, but we're going to talk about some of the diversion programs that we have now, uh, some that we... Um, we know uh, that we can put numbers to uh, that are working, um, but you know the the I don't know what the population of our jail was uh, 20 years ago, but certainly you're going to see that increase as we get as our population grows in Winnebago County. Along with that, will the crime will grow with Winnebago County? I think we increased uh, roughly 2,000 uh, citizens since the last census. Uh, which was taken in 2010, uh, so there'll be another one coming up soon, and so we're, we continue to add citizens as well, and not all of them um, uh, stay out of our facility. This is our, uh, our, uh, our core jail population. So this blue is the average daily population, and the red is a peak month. So when you go back to 2003, when we opened our facility, we opened it up with an average uh, daily population for the year, 202 inmates. We hit a high in 2003 of 
250, and we held that for a month. So that was uh, one month during that year in 2003 where we had a monthly uh, uh, 250. And then you can see that we have some spikes here. In 2009, uh, we uh, went uh, over the, the uh, 300 mark, and we had a, a 339 uh, day a month or 339 inmate month and then we see some uh, some time where we start to come down a little bit and we start to come down but we're now driving back up and again what's actually causing this I mean we're concerned about uh, the heroin but uh, methamphetamines have also made an increase in our area uh, is something that we're equally as concerned about that drives other crimes along with uh, just not just the uh, the drug trafficking and the drug trade this is a uh, highest uh, population in a day uh, per month, uh, and this is last year. So uh, we started off okay, 307 was our high day, but we ended up here at 358 in November. And this is actually a little uh, skewed. This is 358, these are actual uh, numbers that we had on a count sheet, but we also had at one point during uh, this particular day, we had 20 people waiting to be booked into our facility, and we had 10 waiting to leave. So it's actually a little bit more than this, but 358 that we know we could put our finger on. It's not that we lost track of anybody, it's just they didn't make the official count. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about our sentenced inmates and uh, our average daily population again for the year, and then peak months. So we're going to see that uh, we have... Uh, uh, some peaks here for sentenced inmates, and then they actually start to come down. And even though our uh, ADPs overall continue to stay up, our actual sentenced inmates are down. And the reason for that is the crimes that are being committed are crimes that they're not being sentenced to jail for. Uh, these are more serious crimes. They're going to go to prison, so they spend time in our facility awaiting the judicial process, which is actually pretty quick in Winnebago County. Uh, comparatively speaking. Uh, it is something that we meet with the DA on. It is something that the district attorney is aware of, and it's something we discuss during our safe streets meetings on occasion, and uh, the judges are aware of as well. But again, we actually see this, uh, this decrease in sentence jail population. So they've been sentenced to actual jail time. So it could be a, a drunk driving second offense, uh, could be a misdemeanor battery, uh, maybe a little bit lesser offense. Then we have non-sentenced, and you can see that uh, uh, these are uh, people who are awaiting uh, trial, um, and we're starting to uh, make that increase up, which actually correlates with what we saw on the previous slide. Felony probation holes. This is an area that we have discussed. What if we told the state of Wisconsin we're not taking them anymore? And well, while that, I'd love to do that. But of those 55 inmates, that ADP, of those 55 inmates, only four, it's, it's four and a half, but four to five inmates would actually fall into that because 50 of the inmates are on other charges as well. So they committed another crime, and now they're here on a felony probation hold on top of the other charges. So I couldn't even say, hey, we're not taking them. Uh, it, would, it would be a little bit of a relief valve for five, um, but you know, I don't know that we're ready to create that kind of stir for five inmates. Misdemeanor probation holes, you can see those are you know, making, a, uh, they're decreasing, and we just don't have that. First of all, I, I think we're seeing a decrease overall for, in, or for individuals that are being placed on uh, uh, probation for misdemeanors uh, and being placed in our facility. When we start to get to those, even when we don't get to those high numbers, we have a uh, person from probation and parole that works out of our facility and we have constant contact with him trying to make sure that we are releasing inmates that um, have been held in our facility on just probation holes uh, and getting them back out on the street if it's appropriate, if they're not being, if they're if they're not being revoked, meaning uh, they're going to sit their sentence now instead of being on probation, whether it's felony or misdemeanor. Our work release, uh, this is 2017 data, our work release unit. 
Uh, we average uh, 20 people a day uh, on Huber. Uh, that is much less than some, I think we're gonna have a slide coming up here of uh, what we had in the past. But again, the, uh, uh, the, the inmates that are being sentenced to jail are not eligible for Huber uh, because the crimes that they're committing uh, doesn't make them eligible for Huber or they're awaiting a trial and they have to be sentenced first. They have to be sentenced with Huber. So inmates exercising their Huber privilege are allowed to uh, leave the facility, go out to work, take care of ch uh, child care. They go to uh, medical appointments, et cetera. Then we have uh, electronic monitoring. We have 25 inmates per day that we averaged and that's that house arrest I talked about. Uh, we, uh, we monitor GPS location and alcohol consumption. Uh, and we do pretty well with uh, those that uh, follow our rules on both uh, Huber and electronic monitoring. I might also mention that some of the inmates that, uh, are, that are sentenced with Huber, we'll find them a job and they'll go out to work and we won't see them again because they don't come back. And uh, so we've, uh, we, you know, we've tried that several times and uh, there's, there's concern. So uh, not only are the number of inmates uh, that are sentenced with Huber down, but those that actually um, work on a regular basis is down. So then we get back uh, into our 24-7 alcohol monitoring and 24-7 uh, drug monitoring program. Uh, we average 77 participants a day uh, on the alcohol and 32 on the drug. And those are pre-sentence inmates. They haven't been found guilty of anything, but, and they're not in our jail. They're out on our program, and uh, for the uh, alcohol one, we take a, uh, it's called a uh, sober link. It's a, uh, a preliminary breath tester that they have to take with them. They give us a sample every four hours, or we can request an additional sample, and it sends us to it. It's web-based. It's got a, uh, uh, it takes a photograph of them. It has a uh, uh, that recognition, facial recognition software, we know if they're cheating, and they, they try. I could show you some pretty funny photos. Um, they try, but uh, we will typically catch them. And uh, so we have 77 participants on that, and then with the drug monitoring, every two days we require them to come in and give a uh, urine sample, and we check for uh, drug usage. Now, those 77 and 32, well, definitely the electronic monitoring, those are people that are no longer in our facility, so they're gone. We've been using that for quite some time. The 24-7 the, uh, alcohol and drug, those are, I can't say that the 109 that are on that program would otherwise be in jail, but I could tell you that some would. They would be on cash bond, and they would be holding a spot in our jail. How many? It fluctuates, and each judge is a little bit different, but it's very popular with our judges, and we're looking uh, now to even improve it. The electronic monitoring population, as you can see in 2006, uh, the spikes and where we are now. And again, the inmates that we have in our facility aren't eligible. Um, so we are, you know, rightfully so, very particular, and they have to be sentenced with it, but we're very particular about who goes out. We want to keep our community safe. They did something wrong. We want to make sure that uh, the community is safe. Our diversion programs, and this is in collaboration with the district attorney's office and the courts, DHS, uh, we all get together, and these are the programs that we collectively run. This is a, actually an Oshkosh uh, PD program that is being started now. Some of these are just getting started, this uh, driver's license reinstatement program, which uh, we're pretty excited about because that drives a lot of the, the issues. I can't drive to work, I can't do this, I can't do that because I don't have a driver's license. I may never have had one and we're working hard to make sure that they, they do get one. And then uh, we're starting this sexting diversion program. This is really more for uh, the younger uh, high school age people but it could obviously, you, it could be used and will be used for adults but it would be very, uh, uh, we'd, we'd scrutinize it much more closely. But we don't wanna give a kid um, a, a felony record uh, from making one poor decision on a text or by distributing something. And again, uh, these are work together. Some of these have been around a long time. Uh, and uh, I don't know of any other programs that exist. We've looked at other states, and I mean, there are some that, uh, some of the programs that are out there, 
but certainly I think we are giving everything that we can into our diversion program. The 24-7 uh, drug and alcohol, that began in 2001, or I'm sorry, 2011. We have had over 2,200 participants on the program. The drug program began in, in 2014. We've had 309 participants on that program. Uh, and again, that ADP together, the, the, the amount of people that are on that average daily population are 109, uh, reducing the amount of beds by uh, X amount, but it, it, it uh, varies. Our court services unit, that's part of our corrections division as well, and I only bring this up because if we increase our bed space, it's going to increase this too. Uh, we uh, did uh, moved uh, over 2,300 adults and juveniles in 2017, traveled more than 150,000 miles. Uh, we opened up our courthouse security in April of last year. We turned away 977 items that include ammunition, tools, et cetera. We confiscated 237 items that included a box gutter, nail punch, toy gun, knives, handcuff keys, and metal files. Um, we also have had uh, numerous, uh, I shouldn't say numerous, we've had several occasions where we've had individuals come with an empty holster. You have the right to conceal carry, certainly, but when you come into this facility, you have to place it in your car. Uh, in, and now we know that we uh, don't have those people either forgetting or coming into our facility with the weapon. Secure body pass. This is a, a, something we started in 2014, or we purchased in 2015 um, using the, uh, the inmate uh, account, which is a, we get money from the state that is derived from a pool of money that comes that we can use for our jail. We buy uniforms, we uh, uh, buy other things uh, for the comfort of the inmate. This, is also, this was purchased from that funds as well, so we didn't use uh, uh, taxpayer money per se uh, to, to purchase this. And in 2014, we had a heroin overdose in the jail. It came in through the body cavity of one of the individuals uh, who uh, we searched, and it was, uh, we, it was one of those inmates that we could not uh, strip search, and they came in, and uh, uh, there was an overdose. And we decided uh, uh, collectively that uh, we were going to purchase a, a body scanner. We have in 2016 done over 16,000 scans and in 17 over 17,000 scans uh, and confiscated uh, 36 items. It, it had a, a chilling effect pretty quick because word got out that you couldn't bring stuff into our facility. So they stopped doing it for the most part. But we have taken marijuana, drug paraphernalia, prescription pills, cocaine, methamphetamines, heroin, chapstick, um, house key. Uh, it, it's weird, but I swear it happened. <laughs> Contracted services, Aramark Correctional Services is our food service. We, uh, we contract uh, uh, for 377,000. Our budgeted meal cost is a dollar for, uh, was $1.14 in, in uh, 2017. It came in less than that, because as our counts go up, we get a discount for the more meals that we serve. It's staff, uh, staff seven days a week, and the coverage is rotated be, between four contracted employees. And again, we may see some of these costs go up as if we, uh, if we add on to our facility. Then there's uh, Correct Care Solutions. They do our uh, health services. It's $650,000, it's a lot of money. It's staffed uh, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. It's rotated between three contract nurses, or I'm sorry, six contract nurses. We have mental health coverage for 40, uh, 40 hours, Monday through Friday. Uh, nurse practitioner comes in 12 hours a week and a doctor comes in two hours every other week. And then we uh, have basically nurse direct available to us, but uh, we don't have to wait. We're actually talking to somebody we know. Um, in uh, 2017, uh, they uh, complete medical uh, Medication passes two times a day. They responded to 3,200 sick calls, 1,000 health uh, assessments, 155 emergency responses, so either somebody that was in a medical crisis, whether it be a, a heart attack, we've had, you, you name it, the gamut of things occur in our facility uh, as it's a, a small city in itself. Uh, mental health, we had 550 request slips that we responded to, 950 examinations, and 1,200 inmates 
were prescribed psychotropic medications with an average of two per inmate. So we have about 20% of the inmates on psychotropic medications for mental health issues, which uh, mental, uh, those that are, are, are mentally ill inmates are very labor intensive and, and they create a lot of different issues as you can imagine. The Kimmy study that was completed in 2011 projected our jail population to be at 386 in 2015. That would require 460 beds to maintain our functional capacity of 90%. Current kitchen and laundry facilities designed to accommodate 800 inmates. Kimmy's suggestions were 64 bed male Huber housing unit. Uh, you know, we, we know that we really probably don't need a 64 bed male uh, Huber housing unit because we're only averaging 20 a day. And I don't see that actually going up. 64 uh, bed minimum housing unit, a 48 bed maximum security housing unit, it would add a total of 165 beds for 531. Projected ADP uh, that, what we did was we took Kimmy's formula and we went out to 2030. And uh, we just figured out their math and uh, that's where we would be in, in two, or 2030 if we continued down or if we uh, continued on his projection. Now his projections were high on ADP and we've managed to stay below them. But when you look at the, uh, the monthlies, he's actually pretty close, the high months. He was actually fairly close um, in most of those instances. And it's like having uh, your relatives come over on Christmas. You can handle the 20 relatives for six hours, but if they decide to stay for a month, you got a problem. <clears throat> Other related costs, staffing, maintenance, utilities, medical, mental health, food and laundry costs, and then uh, workstations in those pods. Now there is, uh, you know, as we talked uh, with what Kimmy had suggested, there's, there's nothing extravagant there. There's no pit of misery. It's uh, just as you saw it. Um, it's, uh, it is what it is. Um, we did put in CIP. Uh, uh, projected numbers for another study, if that's what, I'm not asking for anybody to decide anything tonight, but certainly something for you to consider. And uh, please, you know, make sure that you contact me with any questions you may have, either tonight or later. Anybody have any questions for him? That was, oh, no, thank you, that was very informative. Okay. Supervisor Eisen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sheriff Matz, uh, Your Honor, uh, I did a little checking into Wisconsin County Jails, uh, and I came up with a chart uh, that uh, showed 2008 to 2016 admissions. And uh, the 2016 figure for Winnebago County uh, was 5,982 admissions. I think that was the same number that you had shared with us. And I looked at our neighbor to the north, uh, out of Gamey County, and they had 5,991 admissions. That's nine admissions more than we had. And the capacity of the out of Gamey County jail is 556. Uh, I, I think that there's probably a lot of intensive work being done in Winnebago County uh, with alternatives from incarceration. And I'd like to uh, commend you and the staff and uh, the uh, other uh, partners uh, in the work that's done there. I think that's, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know what uh, additional investigation or comparison uh, your department has, staff has done in respect to their situation and our situation, but that's a big, uh, a big gap. Thank you. Supervisor Shorsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I have just some uh, questions that, that I'd like to ask. And first of all, I didn't 
see any um, information about where are the inmates come from. And you'll understand why I'm asking this <laughs> um, in, in a little bit. But um, do you have that information available? Like, where, uh, where is their home county? Sure. Uh, what city they belong to? No, I don't have. Uh, uh, most of the population, uh, and, and although I don't have an, an exact uh, statistic for you, um, uh, most of them are Winnebago County residents or at least taking up temporary housing here. Right, right, yeah. And it, that would be interesting to look at, you know, who's lived here over, I don't know what the number is, six months. You know, are they a quote-unquote permanent resident? And that's tied with um, a question. I, I was around in the days when we were debating having the prison come here. And one of the deals the community made with the, with the state at the time was that um, prisoners would be discharged to their home counties. And I understand through the grapevine that over the years that, um, that agreement changed. And I don't know if the county was given money to help with that, you know, I, I don't know. But um, I guess my question is, have we ever done an impact study to see how the presence of the prison, and you could add Winnebago County to that perhaps, um, affects the population in our community and what's happening, um, especially related to law enforcement and some of the other issues in the community. So I just put that on your on your plate, <laughs> to, and I don't know if you have an answer for that today. Um, and then I guess going along with that is is there a correlation when you look at your history and your population? Is there a correlation um, of when? that release agreement changed and what we're seeing in our county now. I was not aware of the release agreement. It was there, yes. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know when it would have ended. Um, and my understanding, it was done quietly. You know, it wasn't something that there sure. was a, a good community discussion about it. And it was, it, and at the time, we felt it was very critical to keeping our, um, you know, maintaining our community, um, the quality of life that we wanted here. And also not to have to pay for um, expenses that belong to someone else, or at least the state, <laughs> if not um, other counties, but the state. And then uh, I didn't see any average costs per inmate and, you know, that sort of thing. That would be nice to see in future sure. presentations. Well, we do, uh, if we take an inmate from another, uh, uh, from another county, which does happen on occasion, but now that our numbers are getting high, it's not as nearly as often. We get 5146 a day. Um, what does it cost to house that right. inmate? Right. It depends upon the inmate. Now, our infrastructure is there, and the nursing care is there, and the, the uh, food vendor is there, but it really depends upon the inmate. Sometimes they can take our resources and skyrocket them. Well, it would be interesting to see what is the range and mm -hmm. then what is the average. So the median um, would be nice to see at some point. And then regarding our investment in diversion programs, um, do you, are you doing some outcome measures instead of just counting numbers of people who participate? Are you looking at outcome measures to see whether our investment moves those numbers or not? And I know that is not a perfect world, but um, it does help yes. in terms of knowing whether we really should be spending money in, on certain programs. Sometimes you spend, you realize you should spend money on uh, fewer programs or more effective programs, that sort of thing. Yes, uh, there are. Uh, some of the programs are looked at. Our 24-7 program for alcohol, we looked at recidivism rates. So how many uh, repeat drunk drivers come from the 24-7 program, we used the same criteria. They had to be off the program for six months or more. What we found was that we had a 13% repeat recidivism rate where the state average is 31%. Mm -hmm. So we saw a, we know that program's working. Maybe yeah. it does work for uh, uh, not only to reduce the jail population because those people would otherwise possibly be on cash bond, but also if they're not uh, committing that third offense OWI they're not being sentenced to the to the jail for additional jail time or coming back to go through that judicial process how many is difficult to say because 
I don't know how many drunk drivers we're not catching. So, uh, right. So that it's, it's really one of those where we can look at the people we touch and the people that hopefully we're making a change on, uh, but then there are a number that we're not. Uh, some of the other programs are looked at as well. We're only, uh, and, and I don't mean that I'm not concerned about them, but we're responsible for our 24-7 program. That's really the only diversion program we truly run. Uh, so I know that the other entities, such as the DA's office, uh, the drug court is being looked at by the courts, and, and cons uh, uh, some of those are available to you. Okay. So there's not a cost to the county for those, where we're collaborating with partners? Right. Uh, actually, the DA's office, I believe it... Um, is the domestic abuse diversion program uh, had the uh, university do theirs mm -hmm. at no cost. They looked at um, okay. how effective it is. Great, thank you. And then um, on your projected ADP population, 2010 to 2030, was that age and demographic adjusted? Um, no. It was not. Okay. It's just based on uh, the, the, the simplest math formula we could see that was used by our consultant back in 2011. And we didn't get into uh, uh, the aging of uh, the population of Winnebago County. Okay. Um, no. That, that may affect it as well. Okay, that's, um, that's all I had. But the, the biggest question I think for me personally is what is that impact of the prison and what's, what's happening as a result of, of them being discharged into the community and, and the effect on our program. That might be a really tough one to try to figure out. I, I know, I know. And I did try to, as kind of a, an aside, which I won't bore everyone with, but I did talk to our state representative and tried to get information uh, from the corrections people, and they refused. That was when Jess King was our representative, and um, uh, they refused to release the information to me. Okay. So anyway, but and thank you for your good work. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Super, Supervisor Wojciechowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Sheriff Motz, for the report. I just had two questions that I wanted to possibly get some more information on. Um, you might not have the data right with you, but um, do you know how long unsentenced people occupying beds, um, how long they're in there before their case is actually heard? You know what the average wait time is? Uh, for I can tell you for an OWI, it's typically... Uh, um, I want to get this right. I don't, I, I don't know exactly. And it depends upon each of the individual cases. I believe it's 76 days for an OWI, which really, and when you think about it, there's some complexity to the case. And uh, if that's if they uh, contest it and, and there's a, a trial and, and those types of things. So to say uh, we can tell you what the average is, for the entire non-sentenced and how long it takes them to go through. But um, that would be somebody who's charged with first degree intentional homicide and someone who's charged with OWI. One may be a year and one may be 25 days and you end up with, I don't know if you end up with a real accurate number, mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll get you that information. Have you um, <clears throat> been seeing like overall the times of people in jail increase um, as a result of there not being as many staff people maybe in the DA's office? Have you seen people being in jail longer because of that maybe? That, that's a question for the district okay. attorney that I, I don't know that I want to answer for them. That's right. Um, and then my last question was um, kind of relating um, to more of the demographics of how many people are incarcerated because of incidents related to mental health or um, addiction? Um, and are those numbers getting higher? Well, sure. The, the opioid addiction, the number of mental health, uh, the inmates suffering from mental health issues is on the rise. I think the number of general public suffering from mental health issues are on the rise. I, I think that's a statistic that's pretty well known. So it just correlates with our, our jail population as well. Um, it's a concern, and certainly they require um, additional work and labor and programs and uh, uh, sometimes medications, and they, they eat up our, our medical services as well. Um, I, I don't have a, a solid answer on how we keep mentally ill people out of our facility. I know uh, my staff would love it if we could. Um, it, you know, for some of them, it's not the appropriate place to be, but it's where they end up. They commit a crime when they're at Winnebago Mental Health, and they're, they're a safety security risk there. Um, 
and they come to our facility. Thank you. Supervisor Higg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair Motz, for your presentations. Very enlightening as usual. Uh, just a couple questions. One is in regards to OWI incarceration. What percentage of the total population are uh, OWI? Well, uh, I, I will get that too. I can get it to all the board members. I'll send it to the, to the county clerk. Um, I, I don't have it off hand, um, but drug, I think if I remember right, the pie chart shows that uh, drug related crimes are the highest. Um, and then uh, uh, I believe um, the alcohol related are second highest. Um, but I don't have the exact number. I think it's about 20 percent. And I, there was a law change not that long ago in regards to OWI. How did that affect the population and how would a potential uh, second or uh, further changing state law affect incarcerations of OWI? Well, when you look at like OWI laws and, and I know that we lowered our uh, legal limit um, and there were adjustments made, but when we look at what the average uh, prohibited alcohol concentration is for our offenders that we arrest, it's much higher than a .08. Uh, we're at .14, .15, is tip, that's our typical offender. Uh, not that we don't run into the 08 and make an arrest for that, but typically, we, I don't know that that particular change made much difference at all. And then with adding additional time and uh, you know, certainly that adds more jail time, uh, but what uh, what difference it makes, uh, you know, I can't really say for sure. Do we house ju juveniles? No. Uh, there's talk more recently about the closure of Lincoln Hills and, you know, changing that facility. How might that affect our facility, and is it going to become necessary at some point in time to, you know, build something for juveniles? I believe that uh, uh, human services in speaking with them, uh, they have a contract with uh, Fond du Lac and we're covered as far as uh, the amount of juveniles that we currently have. Uh, but, you know, if that, if that were to rise, I certainly, that would be another facility. There are so many different things that have to be adhered to in order to uh, house juveniles. Um, it's something that we had tried or something that we did for a number of years in the uh, the old facility and uh, I was actually a jail deputy back then and and worked there so um, you know more programming and and uh, more things where we become uh, the social worker and I don't know that the sheriff's office is really designed for that thank you well stated as usual supervisor Lowton Schlager thank you mr. chair thank you sheriff Mott for the presentation I guess the question I have is when each inmate is booked, are they also given a, I know you use the, the, the compass classification system to where they go within the system itself. I mean, but is, is each inmate given, say like assessed or uh, survey questions or whatever on social issues? And the reason why I bring this up is because uh, I was out at the uh, uh, NACO uh, convention uh, in Columbus, and there's some counties uh, that sheriff's uh, offices have, have, when they come in on booking, they, they give them like two or three simple questions, you know, to determine, you know, if they're mentally ill, if, you know, for alcoholism or whatever, uh, uh, family histories and stuff like this. Do we do that in our jails here? We do. We have two class of civilian classification people that meet with the inmates shortly after they arrive, within 24 hours of arrival, and then they are Part of that classification is, uh, do you have any addictions that we need to be aware of? Uh, what have you done for uh, counseling? What have you done for rehabilitation? And then we try to link them up with what we have available to us. And if you remember, uh, in 2018 budget, where was approved a, a position through DHS, where they're going to work at our facility and those individuals who are being released, we want to continue that care. So they're going to hook them up with the, the uh, resources that exist now in our community because that's I think where we were losing many of our people they are being released from our facility they're sober for the first time in a, a fairly a long time and now we're going to link them up with resources and I'm hoping that will impact our
jail population in a positive way yeah. as well. Yes, I was, I was glad to see that position because that was definitely needed because that was one of the other things that these other counties concentrating at this conference was was after after care after they were released or whatever that the the follow up care and stuff was was already in place before they were discharged. So I, th I thank you for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Supervisor Powers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This was just a sort of a follow up for, for uh, Supervisor Haig. We don't have a high population and never have had of, of juveniles um, at Lincoln Hills and Copper, Copper Falls. Um, and we have, as of, as of Wednesday, we have no one up there. We were down to the last, last female child and she was sent out, out of the area and, and Dr. Topol and his staff have been very good about looking for other, other places to place children um, who need to be incarcerated rather than th that facility for the past uh, two years. So we have no one there now and the top has been somewhere around 3.2 in a, in a given day um, and that's, that's high. Supervisor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sheriff Butts, how much of that uh, medication that we have going into the prisoners is for uh, people with mental conditions, psychotropic drugs, and are we getting any state assistance to pay for those? We, we do get some uh, that were reimbursed for uh, medications and some of the medical services, uh, but you know, majority of that is, is on a tax levy and uh, is part of running a jail. Uh, the, the individuals, I can tell you that our, our, our health services do a, a great job and they're very judicious about who they put on medication and who they do not. Uh, they aren't just handing them out uh, to over medicate or to try to uh, medicate a problem away. Uh, they are looking towards the long-term care of the uh, inmate, not just while they're in our facility. So for, for anybody to be in jail, hey, that's a stressful time, and certainly I could use some medication to help me get through it. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, they look at the long-term care. Thank you. Supervisor Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sheriff, uh, I, I know that when Kimmy did his first projections, they, they were based on demographics uh, and what the aging community would be based on uh, the normal range of offenders. Uh, but I also know that uh, those projections uh, were not met and weren't met because uh, of you and your staff, to be quite frank with you, with all the diversion programs you, you guys were looking at. <clears throat> so I, I want to applaud you for doing that. Thank you. Secondly, uh, you had pointed out, and, and I've said this many times, but I, I want to say it again uh, for this body, uh, you pointed out classification issues as far as separation of inmates or housing of inmates based on certain criteria that, that the compass requires or suggests. Um, you're a lot like a, a uh, hotel in the fact that uh, you, you have a lot of people coming in. Difference is you can't ever have a no vacancy. You're always getting, uh, you can't say no is my point. Right. When you're not able to classify and house by classification, can you explain the the problems that it creates for you and the potential liability issues that it creates for you and the, the county as a whole. Sure, if we're not uh, able to follow the classification system that we're required to uh, by statute, then uh, we are deliberately indifferent to the safety of our inmates in our facility. So we open ourselves up to civil litigation uh, when we aren't able to classify inmates appropriately in our facility. Uh, safety and security of the facility and the inmates uh, is that's our number one goal all of the other things with programming and and uh, uh, recidivism rates and and all the other charts are are fun but safety and security of the inmates in the facility is our primary goal and we can no longer do that because of overcrowding we put ourselves in a very precarious situation just one last comment on that Back in 1988, uh, there was a case out of our county that went to the U.S. Supreme Court that talked very specifically about that legal, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember how they phrased it, but our court counsel knows about it, but you, you create a legal relationship, uh, and that legal relationship is, is uh, uh, what gets us into trouble if we don't house them uh, correctly. So, Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Okay, there are no more questions. Thank you, it was very informative. Thank you. Okay, now we'll be doing the Winnebago Water Program update. Jessica Schultz, Executive Director of Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance, Corin Doring, Winnebago County Waterways Program Coordinator, and the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, we are really excited to update you all on where the Winnebago Waterways program has gone in this past year and where we're gonna be going in 2018 and 2019 with your support. Um, Jessica Schultz with the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance. I'm the executive director and this is Corinne Deering. She's the Winnebago Waterways program coordinator. Before we dive into the Winnebago Waterways program, I just wanted to introduce those of you that have not met us yet to the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance. The Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance is a growing nonprofit um, based out of Kimberley right now. We used to have our offices in Menasha and then we moved to Appleton. And right now we're in Kimberley. Um, we've been around as a nonprofit for just about 30 years working in the watershed. And the bulk of our time, or the bulk of our efforts during that time, have been spent in the lower Fox River watershed. I want to take a minute to show you our basin. So the Winnebago system is part of a much larger watershed called the Fox Wolf Basin. It starts way up um, past Crandon, Wisconsin, and drains down the Wolf River, drains south, ends up in the Winnebago system. Um, we also have the upper Fox River watershed, which is this area, that drains northeast and ends up in the Winnebago system. And then all that water leaves Winne Lake Winnebago and actually drains northeast up into the Bay of Green Bay and ultimately out into Lake Michigan. So this is a, a really large watershed, the largest in the state and the third largest watershed to the um, Great Lakes Basin. The Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance does a lot of for a, for a large variety of work in the watershed. Um, we do a lot of outreach and education. We're in the school system talking with the youth about their impact on the waters. We do um, volunteer events, including an annual cleanup all around the system. Um, we hold an annual watershed conference. Um, but the real meat of what we do is we wanna really see a difference in the water quality in the region. So we have um, a subset of our organization called the Northeast Wisconsin Stormwater Consortium that's working on improving um, urban water quality through um, urban practices like rain gardens and stormwater ponds and things that you're probably familiar with in your own communities. We're also working in the agricultural sector we are not agricultural experts by any means. We rely on our county partners, our land conservation partners, to really do the work. But what Fox Wolf excels at is bringing partners all together and seeking funding to have a greater impact than one entity could alone. In the past three years, we've been able to bring in um, just over $5.5 million into the lower Fox River watershed, um, which is 
from the Lake Winnebago up into the Bay of Green Bay um, to do agricultural conservation practices and water quality monitoring. So that funding that we were able to bring in through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative went to Outagamie County Land Conservation Department, Brown County, and Calumet County to work with the, the producers in the watershed. So that's a little bit about us. Um, we could talk for an hour all about Fox Wolf, but we're not gonna do that. I'm gonna let Corinne talk about the Winnebago Waterways Program. Okay, all right, how close do I have to get? There we go. So uh, the Winnebago Waterways Program through Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance has three main focus areas. Community outreach and education, aquatic invasive species, prevention, and lake management planning. So tonight I'm gonna focus on lake management planning. Um, and the, the, everyone should have received a handout that um, has a lot more information than what I'm gonna dive into tonight. I'm just gonna kind of give a brief overview of the project, um, let you know kind of where we're at up to this point and what our plans are for 2018. So the, the goal of lake management planning is to coordinate with stakeholders and project partners to develop a framework for cooperation throughout the region to improve upon existing programs and efforts that aim to restore or protect the Winnebago lakes. So how did we get to this point of lake management planning? Some of you uh, may have heard about or been familiar with phase one, which, is, which was way in Winnebago. And the purpose of that was to um, get some insight and see what the public thought the, the big problems were with our lakes. And what came out of that was top three concerns, which were polluted runoff, um, harmful algal blooms, and aquatic invasive species. So the group, the, the project partners that initiated Wayne and Winnebago wanted to see how can we work together to cooperatively manage the system. So that led to phase two, which was um, exploration into that, that options for cooperative management. Phase two then led to phase three, which is where we're at now for lake management planning. And that's where we're constructing that framework where we can all um, work together throughout the region to see those improvements in the system. But our ultimate goal is to get to phase five, so implementation. So the lake management plan is going to outline different recommendations, so things that we can do on the landscape, and phase five is really where we're gonna get that work done. So why do we need a lake management plan? The size of the lakes makes management difficult. Um, it's a large geographic region with multiple jurisdictions, and there's a variety of competing interests. The lakes are degraded. As the, the public correctly pointed out, there's harmful algal blooms, polluted runoff, aquatic invasive species, among a variety of other issues. And the lake management plan will ultimately open up some funding opportunities um, <coughs> to see some of that work happen on the landscape. And I want to remind everyone that some of this stuff it doesn't sound so great, but the lakes are a really great resource. They're vital to our local economies. They serve as, <coughs> excuse me, a public drinking water source for about 250,000 people in the region. <laughs> yeah. And they're important to long-held family traditions. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry about that. <coughs> In 2006, UW Extension did a study that looked at the impact of recreational fishing on our economy, and they found that $234 million comes in annually to the five-county region, just from recreational angling alone. So the project area for lake management planning um, is up here on this map. It's also included in that handout. Our main focus for the recommendations that we're creating with our project partners is on the lakes. However, we wanted to recognize that there are some inputs that come from the watershed that impact water quality. And so we incorporated um, portions of the, the watersheds around the lakes in the plan to make sure that we're creating recommendations that tackle some of the sources of the issues in addition to what's going on in the lakes.
So this slide shows the project framework. Again, this is also in the handout. Um, there's a lot of arrows, and it would take a little bit of time to go through that, and I don't want to bore you with the nitty gritty. But basically, this framework provides, um, allows us to provide ample opportunities for stakeholders to engage at um, multiple stages throughout the process. I think this is a good time to highlight that this lake management plan, it's not a DNR plan and it's not a county plan. It's really a stakeholder plan. And the reason that's important is because in order to see the work actually get done, we need to have that stakeholder buy-in. And in order to have that buy-in, we need the stakeholders at the table helping us to create the recommendations. And this framework allows us to do that. I also I want to take some time to show the participating organizations. Um, this, this list is going to just continue to grow throughout 2018, but um, this is also in your handout, so if you're curious to see as who, what organizations have been involved so far. And uh, when I talk about we, when I say the word we, this is what I'm referring to. And so it's not just Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance, it's also the counties and a variety of other um, people that have been involved. So just real quick, I'm gonna walk through some 2017 project highlights. And this is by no means all inclusive. Um, just a, a real quick list of, of some of the big things that we've um, gone through. But if you would like more details, I'd be happy to have a discussion in the future. My contact information is on the back of that handout. Um, feel free to call or email anytime. So in 2017, we kicked off lake management planning. We defined the project area. We created that project framework. We developed several project partnerships. And we put together four of our um, technical teams. And so those technical teams are the Aquatic Invasive Species and Plant Management Team, the Habitat, Fish, and Wildlife, Recreational Lake Use, Access, and Navigation, and our Water Quality Team. So some quick highlights from those teams. The Aquatic Invasive Species and Plant Management Team designed a um, full comprehensive aquatic plant survey for um, all four lakes, a survey of that size and um, that comprehensive has not been done on the lakes and will be really beneficial for um, looking at water quality, aquatic plant management, as well as habitat. And we're hoping to complete that survey summer of this year, 2018. That team is now moving on to creating an aquatic invasive species strategic plan for the lakes. The Habitat, Fish, and Wildlife team is working on creating a method for identifying and prioritizing habitat project sites. The recreation team is um, recently completed a series of online discussions looking at lake access and lake use and some of the problems that um, might exist there. And they're moving on to looking at developing a comprehensive plan for navigation and safety buoys for the system. And then our water quality team is um, looking at developing a, a comprehensive monitoring plan. So some outreach highlights. Um, again, as I said, this is a stakeholder plan, and so outreach is a big focus to make sure that we build awareness about the project and let people know about the opportunities that exist to get involved. So we held six public events in 2017. We had our big kickoff celebration in April. We held three public meetings to introduce lake management planning to the community. Those were held around the lakes in May. And then we had two public information sessions on water level management um, to combat some misinformation that we found exists out there. Um, and we did that in partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers. We also have kicked off, or we also kicked off and have been trying to, um, working to expand our online communications. So we have a project website that I would encourage you all to please explore and let me know if you have any questions. Um, we do a lot of updates on that website. Um, monthly we put out um, blog articles that describe where the technical teams are and where we're going. We also have a, a monthly e-newsletter. Some of you might be getting that e-newsletter. Um, if not, I'd love to add you to the list. Again, we put out monthly updates on how the project is going. And then we also have a social media presence with um, Facebook and Twitter, and more recently, we've added YouTube, so we're expanding. So 
So for um, 2018, again, this is not an all-inclusive list, but um, just to, to give you some highlights, we plan to continue moving the existing technical teams forward. We'll be forming additional technical teams, so watershed management, shoreline practices, and outreach education. And then we're gonna be forming public focus groups. So this is another level of participation that's in that, that framework um, I showed earlier. We plan to form those groups in late fall or winter. We hope to conduct the aquatic vegetation surveys of, of all four lakes um, this summer. And we're going to begin drafting substantial portions of the actual lake management plan. Our goal is to have that completed by the end of 2019. And so um, finalize and submit it to the DNR for approval. And then we um, plan to continue and expand upon our public outreach efforts. And I'm going to hand it back to Jessica so she can talk about project funding. We want to wrap up our presentation um, saying thank you to all of you to Winnebago County. Um, your support to this project has allowed it to advance. Not only um, right now the lake management planning, but Winnebago County has been a partner. Um, in fact, I think Winnebago County was involved in the project even before Fox Wolf got involved with the project. So that phase one and phase two that Corinne um, explained that was led by um, Calumet County and Winnebago and Fond du Lac counties. So really a leader in advancing, protecting and restoring these lakes. So um, thank you for that support. The, contrib the financial contributions that you all made, the $20,000 um, last year went to a grant match so that we were able to um, to the Wisconsin DNR for a service water grant so that we were able to advance lake management planning. Um, we uh, hope to, we have a second lake management plan grant written and submitted to the DNR right now. We'll hear back February 15th if that plan or if that proposal is accepted. If that's the case, we'll be able to really do a well-rounded lake management plan, including that aquatic vegetation study that we'll need to hire a consultant to finish up for us. Um, if we aren't able to get that DNR funding, we're still going to be able to complete the lake management plan. It's just going to have that aquatic vegetation plan um, not complete, and that will be a recommendation then in the plan to have complete. Uh, I really want to stress um, that Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance isn't all that excited about planning. We're excited about the next step. The plan is a hurdle to get over in order to do the implementation. Um, and so we appreciate that you allowed us with the funding and the support from not, not only the financial funding, but the support from the county staff that's involved in this project to get over that hurdle, to move this lake management plan forward so we can start the implementation. Not having the lake management plan has held the Winnebago system back from receiving DNR grant funding to do implementation practices. So all the water that we have in this region, the largest lakes in the state, we're, we're receiving a tiny fraction of the implementation dollars that go out to do watershed protection throughout the state because we don't have this plan. So really this plan is just a hurdle to get us to that next step to implementation funding. And finally, I want to say thank you um, because for the intergovernmental cooperation agreement that Winnebago County entered into with Fond du Lac and Calumet County. Um, this was a monumental um, achievement or a monumental day for um, the protection of the Winnebago lakes. To have three counties sign a document and get together and say how important the lakes are to your economy, to your residents, um, showed the support and is really helping to build the momentum um, and engage a variety of different stakeholders, other nonprofit organizations, um, those that may have not even been all that interested in engaging in the lake management planning process are coming to the table because you all made it a priority for your counties. So we really want to thank you for um, that support. And if there's any questions, we would be happy to answer them. No, I don't, but I want to, oh, Supervisor Eisen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask Corin a uh, question. Uh, this last Sunday, the Oshkosh Northwestern carried an article in respect to uh, the Winnebago Waterways Steering Committee. Could you speak to uh, that issue? It looks like you're looking for 
someone to apply to become a member at large? Yeah, uh, th thank you for bringing that up. Um, if you notice in the project, the framework under steering committee, um, it lists three members at large. And so we currently do not have those members at large. And we're, the steering committee is looking to um, complete the committee by adding those. And the purpose of those, mem those additional members at large is to make sure that the committee is representative of a broad range of interests. And so there's currently right now an application period. Um, I'd be happy to make sure anyone interested gets a copy of the information as well as the application. And that application period closes on January 24th. At that point, the steering committee will review the applications and um, choose representatives from the community for those positions. Do you have anything to add? Just to build on that, so the steering committee, as you can see in your handout, is made up of um, county staff, so representatives from each of the county have been, are sitting on that steering committee, as well as advisory committee members from DNR, Extension, um, and then the technical team members are also advisory members. Um, but just want to point out that the steering committee also communicates and answers to the Winnebago Waterways Committee, and that's where the elected bodies that are contributing to the development financially um, sit. So the Winnebago Waterways Committee does have connections with the steering committee, and we do report to the Winnebago Waterways Committee as well. Supervisor Higg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I notice on the list of participating organizations that the city of Oshkosh is not on here. Is that accurate? Sorry, I'm short here. Um, as of right now, the city of Oshkosh has not been involved, but they are on our list for, as we develop the additional technical teams to engage with them. Do you know if they have necessarily have objections to what your committee is offering? Um, we have not yet reached out to every municipality and said, please engage with this process. The city of Oshkosh is very engaged with the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance through our stormwater consortium um, and is very um, aware of the project, have not heard any objections, and do believe that when we start having, when we bring together the watershed technical team, which is going to take a look at both urban and agricultural runoff, that the city will play a role on that. And secondly, in regards to funding, I, I know what our por portion as far as Winnebago County is concerned, because we just approved that at Land and Water a few days ago, right? Thank you for that. But, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, in regards to the, the total funding picture, though, and as far as how many years it's going to take to facilitate putting the plan together, what do you see as what that total cost is going to be to get us to the plan that might enable us to get that grant funding? Thank you. Um, we're going to send that information out so you have accurate numbers. So what we'll send you, though, we have all that combined with the, because phase one and phase two, even though the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance was not leading that effort, is part of the lake management planning yeah. process. So we would want to get all those numbers, and we have them all just not at our fingertips right now. And it will be, um, yeah, so the lake management planning process will be complete um, at the end of 2019. We think we'll have a draft plan earlier than that, but like Corinne said, the public buy-in is really important. So we will be taking the draft plan out to the public, getting comments, making changes as necessary, so that we, we have a plan that is implementable and not one that's just gonna sit on that shelf. Okay, thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask Scott Horman from the Appleton Ice Incorporated Board of Directors is gonna give us his annual presentation on Tri-County Ice Arena. everyone. I am uh, Scott Horman. I'm the president of the board of Appleton Ice. 
and I've been in that volunteer position for approximately nine years now, in nine years and a couple months. And uh, Appleton Ice, uh, I've done this uh, presentation a couple times now, and uh, this, so this is the third time. I don't want to uh, state too much, but I'll give you a high-level overview. Uh, Appleton Ice was created back in uh, 1998, and that was when um, Appleton Family Ice Center was being developed, and they were, in essence, uh, the group that was put together to oversee the construction and the operation of Appleton Family Ice Center. So it's been in existence for about 20 years now. In uh, July of 2014, uh, Appleton Ice began to operate the Tri-County Ice Arena. And so it's been about three and a half years now, so this is my third time giving an annual report of some of the things that we have done. Um, in, in years past, I've talked about some pretty significant uh, investments that have been made and the majority of those have been in the infrastructure of the rink itself and there have been few things that have been aesthetic to try and help look I guess uh, the way that Tri-County Ice Arena looks on the inside but for the most part majority of it has been functional to make sure that it, it continues to operate long term and some of those projects that you know, I've talked about in the past uh, we replaced a chiller tower and we uh, rebuilt compressors. Um, we actually had a lighting project. So they were all halogen uh, bulbs, uh, very energy inefficient. It created heat, which is not great in an ice arena. So we uh, replaced those and replaced them with LED lighting. Uh, we also replaced the sound system as well as the carpet and uh, all the lighting system in the lobby itself. So in previous years, we've spent approximately $200,000 on improvements to try and uh, bring uh, Tri-County Tri Ice Arena up uh, to a better functionality. This last year, uh, the main project that we had was to improve the fire alarm system. So, and uh, what we did is replaced a, a, a number of the controls as well as the wiring. And it was under code before, but when we started having um, issues with um, some of the controls itself, we had a fire inspector come in and, uh, in essence, did a lot of repair. And, and that project cost about $20,000, but it was well spent uh, to make sure that we are and continue to be within code. Um, one of the other things that is taking place right now is uh, we're purchasing a Zamboni. And uh, you, know, you don't do that every day. So the one that we have in Appleton right now is the one that was the original one in 1998 and uh, still functions well. Um, what we uh, are purchasing is, uh, is another similar model. The spare Zamboni at Tri-County right now is a 1974 model. So what our plan is, is to take the, um, the, the Zamboni that's being used at Appleton right now, move that over to Tri-County so we have a newer model, more up-to-date as well, and continue to use the one that's there today. That was one that we actually purchased three and a half years ago uh, to make sure that we had a better Zamboni for use compared to what was there previously. Uh, we have a couple other projects that are on the horizon that, you know, again, we continue to talk about um, some aesthetic improvements at Tri-County as well. Uh, one of the things we would like to do is interior painting. Uh, the interior of Tri-County is really the same paint um, scheme as when it was originally built back in the 70s, and it's a light blue. Uh, I think it would be uh, uh, beneficial to actually have the same colors as many of the teams that call that rank home. And there are several high school teams that are red, white, blue, and uh, more of a navy type blue. And that's one of the projects that we are considering doing going forward as well to help out those uh, user groups. Uh, one of the other things that is on the list is improving the arena seating. Uh, and that could just mean painting some of the wood in the, in the structure itself. There is some carpet that's in that structure as well. It would be a good idea to remove, replace uh, that as well, just to bring that up to date. And uh, it's on the list. It's not high on the list but to pave an appropriate section of the parking lot, okay? So one of the things that we had to do in order to open three and a half years ago was um, have the parking lot in a state that was acceptable for the insurance company to allow us to open the doors. And it was in such disrepair that one of the things we had to do was 
uh, grind it and, and, and in essence pulverize it. And what we have done is in essence made um, you know, a pulverized parking lot, we've added gravel, and now over the last three years or so, it is compacted pretty well. So we continue every spring to bring a truckload of gravel in, do a repair we have to. Uh, one of the changes that occurred is I think in the first couple of years, Winnebago County was uh, lending the grading equipment in order to level out the parking lot, make it uh, you know, safe for patrons to, to use. And uh, in spring of 2017, uh, that um, service ended. Uh, we uh, now contract for that to take place, and it costs about $1,500 a time in order to have it graded properly. Typically, it's done a couple times a year. Okay. In years past, there have been questions about is there increased growth at, at Tri County? And, and it's really difficult for us as the operator to really. Um, understand because it's the user groups themselves that have all the information about whether there's growth or not. Uh, what I will say is uh, at the high school level uh, we're not seeing additional ice time but we wouldn't expect that because it's one team they have certain practice hours that they have they have a certain number of games a year that they play so it's pretty consistent and that's you know exactly what we want is consistency. What we are seeing though is growth at the youth hockey level meaning at the Fox Valley Youth Hockey Association, they're purchasing more ice than they have in years past. And that's a direct indication that there are more teams or the teams that they have want more, more ice time. Typically, because there's a finite cost that you can charge for youth hockey, it's, it's, the, it's the former. There, in essence, are more teams. There's more kids that are playing hockey, and they need to um, purchase more ice time to accommodate those teams. Uh, a couple things that are going on. Um, at the rink itself. In March, uh, we'll be hosting a youth state tournament. So again, in, in, if anyone knows anything about youth, youth hockey, there are many divisions. Uh, and there's A, there's B, there's C, depending on how many teams there are in a certain association. So there's many state tur tournaments, but the youth associations request state tournament bids, and one was awarded to uh, be held at, at Tri-County Ice, Ice Arena in March. Um, typically, the ice is in service from September of a given year, and it comes out in March, so the entire winter months. A couple, a couple summers ago, we had a project we did at Appleton, and we kept Tri-County open for the summer months. So we had it open in June, July, and possibly into the first week of August. And what we realized it was, it was very difficult to do that. And part of it because of the insulation and the way that the, the rink was built, it's not really designed to run well in the summertime. So what we've done is adjusted. We still need to alternate rinks. And I think it's great that we operate both Appleton and Tri-County so that when we have to do repair or maintenance at one, that we can have the other rink open. And so the plan is for this year is to close in March as, as normal, but in uh, 2019, which is to be a year from this spring, we are going to be closing Appleton Family Ice Center for two to three months, and we're going to try and do that in the March, April, May time frame. So the plan would be everything that normally operates at Appleton for those three months would be operating at Tri-County, so we'll keep that open until May of uh, 2019. Okay. Um, has anyone heard of a project called Fox City's Indoor Sports Facility. Couple, okay. So I'll tell you high level what I know about this, but it does affect Tri-County and will affect Tri-County in the future. Uh, there's a hotel tax, and there's a hotel hotel tax from a number of communities up in the Appleton area, the Fox Cities. I think there's uh, 11 different communities. Part of that hotel tax is to help fund um, projects that will continue to drive um, hotel stays. So, and there's a sports facility percentage that's assigned to that. It's been accumulating money since the hotel tax started a couple years ago. I, I've worked for three years with the Convention and Visitors Bureau through different proposals, and uh, what appears to have been approved is there's going to be a facility that's built in Appleton or in Grand Chute. So 
Uh, the land was donated from Grand Chute to a nonprofit, which was a subsidiary of the CBB. And there is a RFP out today that is due at the end of this week for a management company to run this new facility. The facility itself is going to house two hockey rinks, and it's going to have a hard court, uh, which will house four basketball courts and eight volleyball courts one or the other. The, the space is available for one or the other. So I will, stay, I will say that Appleton Ice is interested in, in running the new facility. I think it makes sense to have you know, us operate the ice in the area because in essence the user groups that use Appleton and Tri-County today are the exact user groups that whoever runs that facility is going to want to have rent from them. So the user groups today purchase elsewhere. There's not enough ice time in the Fox Cities, and hence it does make sense that we add a couple couple sheets of ice. For example, Appleton Area Hockey Association purchases forty thousand dollars a year, uh, upwards in De Pere and Green Bay and down in Oshkosh, that they have to travel because it's just not available locally. So, so overall, I think it's a very good idea. Uh, what I do know is that Tri County does need to stay open, so. From my perspective and from Appleton Ice's perspective, it's not an either or situation. It's necessary that both stay open. The sports management company that runs this new facility, uh, primary goal is to be um, identifying opportunities to bring people from out of town to stay in hotels. So there's a return on investment for the dollars that are spent from the hotel tax to actually reinvest. And what that means is, on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, it'll be necessary to have tournaments and events to draw people from out of town. The youth or organizations, uh, Appleton Area Hockey Association and Fox Valley, they use Tri-County and Appleton every Saturday and Sunday throughout the winter for youth, youth games. And so it isn't, it isn't, the new facility is not designed for the local youth associations to go and use that rink. It's designed for out of town to come in. It will be available likely for them during the week and for all the overflow time that is necessary. But I just wanted to be up front and say there's uh, a project that's out there. Uh, it's going to expand ice in the area as, along with Hardcourt. And Appleton Ice believes that everything needs to stay open. So that's all I have for a high level overview. Everything is going well with Tri County, there's no concerns with the user groups. And uh, you know it's been been great to operate for the last three and a half years. Are there any questions for Scott, Supervisor Hig? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad to see you here tonight because yeah. there's been rumors circulating around the valley, and yeah. my phone's actually been ringing once in a while. So I appreciate you being here. I appreciate your report. In regards to the, the concept of the new facility, you know, I, I certainly understand it. I've seen several facilities you know, with two daughters playing volleyball in the Midwest and a son playing travel basketball. I've, I've seen these things open and fold all over the Midwest. Um, I think it's very interesting that this facility is designed, like you said, for out of town activities and tournaments to come to the area. I would certainly hope that that um, would be sufficient to keep a facility like that open. I know I think that the new facility over in Harrison is having some difficulty staying afloat the way it is right now but so I, I would hope that the management group would do a good job attracting those and uh, soliciting those events but uh, it's, it's more than anything is nice for me to hear that the tri-county facility will stay open and um, that the mission I think of, of what we tried to do several years ago um, and I think has been quite successful with you guys taking part in that um, will live on so thank you very much yeah it, one, one, one comment it has to be both so it won't survive on just local uh, use I'm talking about the new facility there's just not enough revenue of additional incremental ice time or hard court that's needed to, to survive just on that and it can't survive just on having tournaments on the weekends so it does have to be both so the idea is to, to use the facility as much as possible Monday through Thursday night or Monday through Friday afternoon. You know, there are local users that certainly will want to rent the hard court as well as the ice time. But again, 
the financials have to work, and that's still, I believe, being worked out. Thank you. Yeah. Supervisor Eisen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Scott, could uh, would you have any uh, be able to share with us any kind of uh, statistics on the use of uh, the Tri County Arena? Uh, I know uh, I I visit there frequently Monday nights, and it just seems to be jammed. Uh, in other words, uh, like last night, uh, perhaps there was uh, in excess of a hundred people. Uh, yeah. You know, teams and uh, activities. It's it really is a bustling place. Uh, would you have any numbers? And so, in terms what I can share is uh, we're full. So it, it, it we're full Monday through Friday for sure. And so school ends and high school teams start. So they're gonna start at 345 in the afternoon and, and that, that large sheet of ice is used from 345 until 10 o'clock at night. And it's used once the high school is done, there may be games at night and they're periodically um, you know, scheduled for Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays. It, it depends on how the schedule works with the athletic directors and that, that takes priority. But once those games are scheduled, then the youth groups uh, look and see what is available and they book all the time because they need all the time for practices for their teams. So what is not avail what is not booked is say seven o'clock in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon. It's just not open because there's just not enough activity to keep it open at that time. But Monday through Friday, 345 till 10 o'clock at night, it's, it's busy. And if you take a look at the weekends, it starts early. So it starts at eight, nine o'clock in the morning and it goes pretty much all day on Saturday. And same thing on Sunday. Now, one of the things that we did this last year is we created a new um, open hockey league and we added teams. So we have a over 35 league, we have an open hockey league. There are 14 teams that play every Sunday night and that's between Appleton and uh, Tri-County. So five games occur at Appleton and two games occur at Tri-County. And we have to wait to only have two games at Tri-County because the figure skaters have uh, the ice for a couple hours every Sunday night. So starting at 7.30 when the figure skaters are done, there's two high school, or not high school, two men's league games that go on until about 10 o'clock at night. So again, Sunday is completely full as well. And uh, another question is, uh, uh, could you share with us some of the names of the user groups? Sure. I know that, uh, uh, you know, from uh, figure skating to ice hockey, and uh, could, you, could you share with us and with the public uh, sure. some of the groups that utilize that facility? Because uh, at one time, uh, the, uh, the thought of uh, just eliminating the ice ring uh, did run through the county board's uh, consideration. So prior to us managing, so this goes three and a half years ago, uh, the user groups that used Tri-County were really those that, that only called it home, meaning they were the Nina Menasha uh, Hortonville High School. And you got Fox City Stars High School Boys, Fox City Stars High School Girls. So there's three high school teams. And then there's Valley Figure Skating Club and the Fox Valley Youth Hockey Association. They've always called Tri-County home. But by having Appleton Ice operate and manage it, there was still available time that was available that other user groups that call Appleton home weren't using as well. So we were able to have user groups like Appleton Area Hockey Association, you know, use time that was available at, um, at Tri-County as well. And they have purchased significant amount of overflow time that the, the designated groups that call Tri-County home um, are not using. Thank you. Okay, there are no more questions. Thank you. It was a very nice presentation. All right. All right, thank you. <laughs> Supervisor Robo. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll move that we adjourn until Tuesday, January 16th at 6 p.m. Thank you. We are adjourned.